The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101. We're so happy you joined us this week. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's your host, Susan Bartlestone. In case you're not sure where you are, this is the Personal Safety Radio Show with an optimistic perspective on a sober subject. I'm your host, Susan Bartlestone, and I'm so delighted that you've joined me tonight because it's always my great privilege to spend the next hour with you, helping you keep yourself safe. Uh, Just a couple of quick announcements for you before we get into the show. First of all, I want to remind you that April is National Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. And if you missed the wonderful show that I did last week, commemorating this topic with self-defense activist Tom Callis on how the self-defense community can do more than just teach skills, but really make a difference in the community. You can find that show archived on my Voice America host page and also on my Crime Prevention 101 blog site, so please check that out. April is also National Child Abuse Prevention Month, and Safe Kids Week comes at the end of the month. Why are they always so crowded? I don't know. If you're catching this later, make sure that you check back. I've done a a whole number of uh, child abuse prevention shows. And tonight I'm going to be talking with Erin Marin, who's a survivor of a brutal childhood abuse but has gone on to thrive. And she's such an inspiration that she's going to tell us about Erin's law, which she's trying to get passed so, so school children will have the kind of information that they need to protect themselves from sexual predators. And with her, we've also got an encore appearance with Jill Starshevsky, who's an assistant district attorney from the Bronx, New York, and the author of My Body Belongs to Me, and that's coming up. And as I said, I've done a number of uh, child abuse shows, and I'm going to post the links to those shows uh, probably on my Facebook page as well, so you'll have it. But, of course, we're going to start off the show with our Crime Prevention 101 True Crime Reporter, Tricia Griffiths from WebSleuths.com, which is the largest independently owned true crime forum. And she's going to tell us what cases that people are talking about on the forums this week. And last but not least, we've got our Let's Catch a Criminal segment where I feature a different Crime Stoppers group every week, and maybe we can help them uh, catch a bad guy. So tonight I'll be speaking with Anita Shell from the Anchorage, Alaska Crime Stoppers. And you know, I have got to ask them if they use dog sleds or something to, you know, to catch the bad guys. And if there's a jail cell dog sled or something, right? Okay, I know I'm being silly. All right. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk true crime with Tricia Griffiths. Hello, Tricia. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much again for having me on. I really appreciate it. Now, I'm going to talk first about this case, and it's uh, it's close by where where you're located, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Christine. Indeed. Christine Cooper. Now, you've yes. been following this case for 12 years, and uh, back in 1998, I first heard about this case. I, I remember very distinctly watching it on TV. It was one of the uh, the news programs. They did a whole segment on Christine Kupa and how her it's boyfriend... Kupka, I think. I'm sorry. K-U-P-K-A. Kupka. Kupka. Is, is that Kupka. what I said, Kupka? Kupka. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? It's it's my Utah accent. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll call her Christine. How's that? All right. Anyway. Christine K. How's that? Christine, Christine, Christine. Kupka. Anyway, a uh, beautiful, beautiful woman. She became yeah, pregnant... Yeah. became pregnant uh, by this chemistry instructor who was married. Now, it's my understanding that Christine did not know this guy was married until much later. So mm-hmm. she goes to him and says, I'm pregnant. He tries to convince her to have an abortion. She will not. His name is Rudy Persaud. And the last person to see Christine alive was shock of all shocks, 
Rudy. Now, Rudy's cousin owned, I believe, a plumbing supply store is what it was. And that was where Christine was last seen with Rudy. And when Christine disappeared, Rudy's cousin would never let the police in there to search. They kept going back every six months, and he said no. And Rudy would never talk to the police. I mean, talk about just painting a bright red guilty on your real, forehead. Yeah, real suspicious, you know. right? Well, and exactly. This is, this is like 10 or 12 years now this case is going on, and for all that time, right, Chris, uh, uh, he would not let them come in and look around and look for evidence. He wouldn't. This is a cousin that owned the plumbing store. Now, that, right, to me, I, I'm not a police officer, but they could never get a search warrant, and I just find that so strange because you would think you know, judge, we have a victim here who's missing. She was pregnant, last seen with her boyfriend, who wanted her to have an abor- abortion, and last seen in this one location in this plumbing store. Can't we go in there and look around? Now, you have to remember with a search warrant, the police just can't go in there and find anything and uh, charge a, a, a person with something that they found that wasn't on the search warrant. A lot of times, search warrants are very specific. And unless something is sitting out, unless a pound of cocaine is sitting out, if you're looking for a gun and you find a pound of cocaine somewhere that you're not really supposed to look, you can't use that pound of cocaine against the person. So I, I don't know hmm. why. I would like to... Yeah, I don't know okay. that. It's, it's true that the... Uh, I would like to know why... So the, the, the cocaine doesn't count? No. It, it, now, it depends on the search <laughs> warrant, okay? Oh. Because now if it's laying out, if you walk in, let's say they went into this plumbing store, the police, with the search warrant, and there was a pound of cocaine laying out there. Well, yes, then they could be arrested. But let's say the judge says, well, you can only search, you can only bring in cadaver dogs, and you can only search this part of the basement. Well, if they did that, and then they went and looked somewhere else, and they found a pound of cocaine, that would not be allowed in. So I don't know if, if, I don't know why the police couldn't get a search warrant. It's just very baffling to me that a judge couldn't look at this and say that is prob- probable cause. The behavior is probable cause, and the fact that she was last seen there is probable cause, but they couldn't. Well, they went back finally and found out that Rudy's cousin had sold the plumbing store. Thank right. goodness. So Christine's family, very, very excited. They're very hopeful. They take the cadaver dogs in there. And Susan, the cadaver dog, had a hit, and there was some cement that was different that looked like it had been added later, and the cadaver dog hit like there had been a cadaver there, and they dug it up, and they found bones. And mm. as terrible as that is, Christine's family is, is breathing a sigh of relief, thinking, oh, my goodness, finally we found her. Well, they weren't human bones. Really? So, yes. Now, uh, Rudy, the wonderful boyfriend, is in Florida now. He's a dentist. Still He's refusing. married. Kids, oh, yeah. kids, still married. Still married. She she stuck with him, uh, the wife did, and refuses to help still. Will not talk to the police. Now that's his constitutional right. Unless you're arrested, you have a constitutional right not to talk to the police. And uh, I'm sure he lawyered up quickly and the lawyer said just mm-hmm. don't say a word. But you know, with with forensics as they are now, I'm hopeful that they'll be able to find something or somebody will grow a conscience and go to the police and say, look, I can't live with this. I, I know Rudy did something. you know. And the fact that I can come on your show and say, uh, Rudy killed Christine, and he won't do anything about it, to me speaks to guilt as well. If somebody accused me of murder, I'd be screaming bloody murder at them, saying, you know, I, I didn't do it. What are, you, what are you thinking? But we are discussing, discussing Christine on our forum on WebSleuth.com, and we'd love you to come and, and take a look at it. Maybe you could add something that the police haven't thought of yet. Because there are so many interesting, interesting little twists and turns in this case. Now, Christine told her sister, "If something happens to me, it was Rudy." That she knew. She. I knew remember her. that. That's right. Yeah. She fingered him. She fingered him. She, even before she she was uh, went missing, she fingered him. And and here's the thing: she went missing. They they went and looked at all the hospitals. Uh, when her due date was was around, you know, was was close by, they went and checked the hospitals again. She's missing. It's obvious she's dead. Let's just, you know, not fool around anymore. And it's obvious that Rudy had something to do with it. I'm hoping maybe the cousin, maybe the cousin told his wife, maybe some somebody along that family line yeah. will say enough is enough. And um, finally, when the cops did search, like I said, they were so excited, Susan. 
because there was this slab of cement. It was so perfect. And that, that just goes to show you, even if it looks like everything is pointing to what yeah. you think is obvious, sometimes it's not. There was a slab of cement that looked just like a body had been there. And here's what, what were the bones? Was it like a dog or something? Animal like bones. That? The animal, animal bones. bones. They don't, they don't, wow. I haven't said what kind yet. Now, now, here's the thing you have to remember. That body could have been there for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Mm-hmm. And they'd maybe just recently moved it when he sold the store. That's yeah, the I'm sure they're not going to, they were not going to leave it. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Definitely so, not going to leave it. Perhaps that's why the dog had a hit because maybe there was a cadaver there earlier. And that's the frustrating thing now. There's still hope, you know. They are going through all of that dirt. They're going through everything with a fine-tooth comb. They still might find something. No, and so. if they do, if they do, Susan, if they find one little minuscule something that they can link to Christine, Rudy's in a world of hurt because okay. they will they will swoop down on him like a hawk picking out a fish out of the water. You know, he will be done. And it's very frustrating for Christine's family, especially her sister, I'm to know sure. that that guy is, is walking around having and enjoying his life when Christine's life was taken at such a young age. And it was so sad. Like I said, he was an instructor, mm-hmm. a chemistry instructor, yep. very smart man. Professor, yeah. And you know, as you know Patricia, I had, um, I had Gil Alba, who was the private investigator on this case, on mm-hmm. about two, two or three weeks ago. Great interview with him uh, about this case. And I'm trying to get uh, the sister, Kathy Kupka, on the show, but she hasn't been answering my calls, and I think maybe they're still digesting this kind of this thing. Well, I'm well, sure that oh, this my is God, good. we've come to an end of another no, segment. No, I, yes. I better just tell you one more quick thing. You know what the leading cause of death among pregnant women is? Murder. What? Oh, God. So be All careful, right. ladies. Tracia Griffiths, WebSleuths.com, one of the best forums out there. If you got an opinion, go to WebSleuths.com and weigh in on it. You'll be amazed at the great information you'll find on there. Tricia, we're going to talk again next week. Now, my wonderful audience, what do I need from you right this moment? I need you to stay tuned because when we come back, We'll be talking about child sexual abuse and what one courageous woman is trying to do about it and how we can all help. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. You've got to believe. Listen up. Conceive Magazine is now on the air, live, and on demand on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Hosted by Kim Hahn, founder of Conceive Magazine. Conceive On Air offers comfort and emotional support to women contemplating starting or expanding their family by consulting noted professional experts and by sharing the insights and experiences of others. Kim wants to share her experiences to educate and empower women. Conceive On Air is the only complete resource destination that inspires and informs future moms about their fertility on the journey to parenthood. Conceive On Air with Kim Hahn, celebrating the creation of families. Hi, this is Susan Bartlestone, host of Crime Prevention 101, and I want to tell you about My Mobile Witness, a revolutionary service that transforms your camera phone into a personal safety device. My Mobile Witness believes safety is improved when you remove anonymity from dangerous scenarios. If you're in a stalking situation, for example, if you have an order of protection against someone, or if your profession places you in situations that are potentially dangerous, I want you to check out My Mobile Witness. And you parents of college students, 
ask the school to check out the My Mobile Witness University program with custom-tailored options aimed at keeping both students and faculty safe. Every campus could benefit from the My Mobile Witness University service. For more information, go to MyMobileWitness.com. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello, Susan Bartlestone here. And there's plenty of show left to tune in for and really important uh, material that we're talking about today. So please start tweeting about us. Get people into this audience here. And don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter and you can follow me on Facebook. And I would really love to have you as my friend. All right. And without any further ado, we're going to, I'm going to introduce uh, my next guest to you. Uh, One of my next guests says, everyone is born with a purpose in life. And I found mine because of what happened to me as a child. Erin Marin is now a child abuse prevention activist and the author of Stolen Innocence, where she broke her silence about being sexually abused as a child, and she shares what she went through so that others in the same boat can be motivated to speak out for themselves and inspired to thrive. She's appeared on Good Morning America, Oprah, and many more uh, other important TV shows, and I'm thrilled to have her here with me today. Hello, Erin. Hi. Thanks for having me. And along with Erin, we also have Jill Starshevsky, and uh, she's, this is an encore appearance for Jill on Crime Prevention 101, and she's helping Erin uh, with her work, which you're going to hear about. And uh, a mother of two, Jill is an assistant district attorney in New York City, and she's prosecuted hundreds of sex offenders, and she's dedicated her career to seeking justice for victims of the horrible crime of child abuse and sexual molestation. And after she was working on a particularly heart-wrenching case involving a young victim who had endured years of abuse, she was inspired to write My Body Belongs to Me, which has been a highly praised book, and it draws on her experience dealing with these victims. And key to her work with Erin is the fact that the young victim who finally uh, sought help after, after watching an Oprah Winfrey show about child abuse, and there was no other place for her to get this information. So that's why Jill came on board with Erin. Welcome, Jill. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you back with me again. All right, now let's see. Erin, let's start with you. You say, my mission is to take the stigma and shame off of sexual abuse survivors and give them a reason to speak. Just talk a little briefly about what happened to you as a child. Um, When I was a young child, I was uh, sexually abused not once but by two perpetrators at different times in my life. Um, The first time it happened, I was six years old, and it happened in the home of my best friend's house. Um, by her uncle that lived with her. And um, this was an experience that, you know, as a young child, I was never educated on it, didn't know exactly the term of what sexual abuse was. So when it did happen, I never said anything. I kept quiet about it and moved when I was eight years old, um, thinking I was getting away from one perpetrator only to find out I was getting that much closer to the next perpetrator who happened to be in my own family. And that was a teenage cousin um, that went on to sexually abuse um, me from 11 to 13 years old. And there was a lot of threats of silence um, that, you know, kept me quiet. You know, no one's going to believe you. This is our mm-hmm. little secret. Mm-hmm. I'll destroy our tight-knit family if I told anybody. So I used my diary as my way to um, get my story out by just journaling and hiding my diary under my mattress um, of what I was, what was going on because I knew no other way to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And this is this is fairly prevalent. Uh, I mean, this is fairly common, Jill, in, in these cases. Um, just talk a little quickly about the prevalence of child abuse and from your perspective. Um, I well, feel it's a silent epidemic. Uh, absolutely. 
Um, I think as we have two women, we're going to have to identify <laughs> who's ever speaking here. So, um, Jill, you have any figures uh, that, uh, about the prevalence of it, or any, or Aaron, do you have it? How, how, what are we okay. talking about? This is, this is Jill talking. You know, um, the figures tend to change depending on, on who you speak to, but the most common figure I've heard is that uh, one in four girls and one in six boys will experience sexual abuse before they turn 18, which is an extraordinary number. But I think mm-hmm. the most profound number I've heard is that 93% of all child sexual abuse happens at the hands of someone known to the child, like what Erin had experienced, as opposed to the stranger who abducts a child off the street. That's, that's really the most profound figure that I've heard. Exactly. And Erin's comment about being afraid to talk because of the tight-knit family, that's one of the things that, that keeps, uh, people from, keeps children from telling. Correct. Absolutely. Many parents think that children don't tell because they're threatened. You know, I'm going to hurt you if you tell. I'm going to hurt your family if you tell. And often it's threats, like Erin said, like no one's going to believe you. This is our little secret. They're going to say it's your Mm -hmm. fault. You're going to break up our family. And there's all this guilt and pressure not to tell. And, you know, when you talk to a parent, they think, well, if my child were touched by anyone, of course they would tell me. And they're not really taking into consideration these other, you know, threats that come up. Exactly. Now, Erin, what finally made you decide to speak out, and and what happened in your family after you did? What made me speak out was finding out that I was not alone. Um, At 13, my younger sister came to me one day Uh. and said my cousin was sexually abusing her. And so that sparked me, you know, I have someone to back up my story. And so together we broke our silence, you know, with two of us coming forward, someone has to believe us is what I thought. And that's what got me to eventually come forward and, you know, after a year and a half of abuse going on, you know, holidays, family gatherings, you name it, um, to finally break my silence about it. And did, and the family, did, did par- your parents did believe you, right? Our, I was grateful enough to have parents that believed us 100%, supported us, did the right thing, and turned us into the police. Unfortunately, um, I did not get the same response from my large extended family, um, Mm -hmm. and they all disowned my immediate family. Really? Um, They, and the perpetrator, my cousin, was eventually brought into the police department. He denied, denied, denied until brought into police and confessed. And with the confession and being put under arrest, my large extended family still stood by his side. Um, and to this day, believe that he was forced into a confession. They make excuses saying it was teenage behavior, that my sister and I were engaging in sex acts with him. I mean, we've heard it all, and it's, and it's sick to think that people that you once loved and were such a part of your life and now have disowned you. Did he ever go to jail for this, or is he considered a, is he a, a registered sex offender to this no. day? I mean no, he's not. We went about it the route where we didn't take it to trial because we, my parents felt that my sister and I would be ripped apart on the witness stand. Mm-hmm. Why didn't she tell by a defense attorney the first time? And so we went the route to get him mandated psychological help. He couldn't come within 100 feet of my sister and I, got probation, things of that route. Now, Jill, from your perspective, is, is this the best we could do in this kind of case? What, what, what's recommended? What can we do inter- if we want to try and prosecute these? Well, I think each case is different, and, and you have to do what's in the best interest of the child. And if Erin's family thought that it wasn't in her best interest and her sister's best interest to proceed with trial, then that was obviously the right decision for them. I think many sure. children experience, you know, you know what Erin, what happened to Erin is not uncommon that she disclosed because she had someone to kind of stand with her. But oftentimes I hear of children who are sexually abused, and then they don't tell. But when they get ready to leave the home, whether it's for college or they're moving out and there's a younger sibling left behind, that can also be the motivation for someone to tell because they're afraid that now that they're moving out of the house, they won't be able to protect their younger sibling. So, you know, having a younger child in the family often is um, a conduit for disclosure. Now, this is, this is such a double-sided, you know, question because, sure, you want to protect the children and your heart aches for them, but you also don't want to see a potential, you know, sex abuser out there to do it again to somebody. And the, we know that they don't stop. You know, they don't just, they don't just uh, go, say, oh, okay, made a mistake, sorry, too bad. 
right? They don't. Right. Well, as with any case, I think that you that a, a family and a child has to have the process explained to them, and to just you know to say that a child can be ripped apart on the witness stand. But that's the job of any defense attorney to rip apart any witness on the um, mm-hmm. a witness stand. But if a child, you know, or any witness is, is made to understood that this is what's going to happen, this is how you're going to be confronted, and this is how you know they can understand the process. There's a way of getting through it where it isn't as horrible as it, it sounds like it could be. And certainly, I've taken cases to trial with young children who have not only experienced it, but have benefited from the experience because in some ways it's cathartic to sit there and face your accuser and say, you did this to me and and I'm not ashamed. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to tell the world what you did. But again, each person is different. Oh, absolutely. Um, and Aaron, how, how, let's go back and talk about what happened, uh, what, what happened after the book came out and, and uh, how did you, how did you reconcile what had happened to you and to get you to the place where you're doing the work that you're going to do, which we're going to talk about, too? Um, my, I actually published my first book when I was a senior in high school, and that was Stolen Innocence. And my second book, I kind of catch people up and discuss what it's like to take a public stand, um, the good and bad of going public with something that's so hush-hush in our society. Mm-hmm. Um, in my, my second book that just came out called Living for Today. And... In, in both books, I describe what, what got me to this place was confronting my cousin. Um, mm-hmm. It took going back and confronting him and holding him accountable for his actions. And he responded to all of my letters. We went back and forth for seven months. And I published all his letters throughout my book um, of him eventually coming to the place of apologizing, asking for forgiveness. Um, and me not only holding him accountable, but letting him know that I'm not going to let, you know, hold on to this anger and rage towards what he did to me and let it affect my life any more negative than it already has and began to turn it into something positive by realizing there's so many people out there that have experienced this. Somebody needs to put a face and voice on it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I took my childhood diary and um, began turning it into my first book, Stolen Innocence. And I described that whole process. You see an 11-year-old grow up to, you know, a senior in high school, how the, the emotional roller coaster I went down, and then the aftermath of, in my second book, not, not only on healing your life when this, something like this has happened and, and taking control back, but also the devastation of the difference of when it's stranger danger to, compared to someone you love and trust, especially when it's mm-hmm. a family member, and talking about Absolutely. how I've lost my entire family. Absolutely. All right, you know what, Aaron, Jill, stay with me. We're coming up for a quick pause. We'll be right back with more about uh, stopping child sexual abuse, and we're going to talk about Aaron's Law. So stay with me. Your voice counts. Call toll free 1 866 472 5787. 1 866 472 5787. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention.com. 101.com for more information. What's it like behind closed garage doors where the decisions are made that change motorsports? You'll find out on The Race Reporters because host Michael Knight has been there. He's a 40-year industry insider and award-winning writer and publicist. Each week, Knight brings together the country's top journalists and newsmakers and their insights will make you a better race fan. The Race Reporters, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Power Up Channel. The Internet's number one talk station. Number one talk station. VoiceAmerica.com
You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Yes, indeed. This is Crime Prevention 101, and thanks so much for joining me today. Don't forget to check out my website, crimeprevention101.com, where you can find out more information about show topics and my wonderful guests, and you can find out more about Aaron Marin and Aaron's Law, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, at www.aaronmarin.net, and that's E R I N. And it's M as in Mary, E-R-R-Y-N dot net. And you can find out more about Jill Starshevsky and My Body Belongs to Me, her wonderful book, at mybodybelongstome.com. Welcome back, guys. Thank you so much for sticking with me. All right, Aaron, let's, let's go and talk about Aaron's Law. This is the, this is the culmination now of what you're going to do now that you come to, the, to this point in life. What, what is Aaron's Law? Aaron's Law would require, I'm from the state of Illinois, and looking at the law growing up as a kid, you know, being abused twice, why didn't I ever speak out? Well, the, the truth of the matter is, no one was ever educating me out. I was drilled in my head, tornado drills, fire drills, you know, dare, say no to drugs, the eight ways of how to say no. Where was the mm-hmm. message of the eight ways to get away, the eight ways to tell today? They never came. And so I sat in silence and never said anything. And I feel that with these sexual predators, there's no stop to them. They will always exist in this world. So why not do something where we're giving children the knowledge and tools in, an, in a curriculum in school that requires them to be educated on this and giving them the background on safe touch, on safe secrets, on who to tell when someone is abusing you. And if the first person doesn't believe you, who to go to the next person. On the, the educational component to parents, what, what's the message that educators can send to parents, things they can send home saying this is what we're talking about with their kids. Here are the warning signs to look for. But across this country, we have no mandated laws that require education in schools on this subject. And it's my you know, mission. I, what's that? I was going to say, when I, when I heard that, I was absolutely shocked because I really... I really thought that they did at least cover something. I don't know about mandated, but I, I thought most schools did cover this. Most schools cover it when they get to high school. It's the it's ah. a discussion in house class about sexual assault, date rape, and it's you would not believe how many schools I go and speak to. And I ask the kids, you know, I go through the whole, who remembers tornado drills, fire drills, all the hands, all the hands. They all giggle and laugh. And all of a sudden I go, who remembers somebody in elementary school coming in and talking to you about sexual abuse? The room goes silent, and it, not a single hand in all the years I've been doing this has ever gone up. And it's, and it's sad that kids are not being educated about this. And I can't tell you how many kids come up to me after I speak and tell me this happened to me too. Hmm. So now and, you're, proposing, you're proposing to introduce this in... Illinois, in the state of Illinois. Yes. I'm meeting with a legislator next week, next Monday, and my hope is he will attach a bill to this um, and recognize the importance of mandating. We mandate in Illinois that we have to educate kids on Internet safety. There's a law mm-hmm. that mandates in Illinois that kids have to be taught automobile safety, um, home safety, you know, hot oven safety, things in the home that you have to be safe about. Why are we not giving kids the tools and knowledge to protect their innocence. I just feel it's, it's in this, here we are in the 20th century and we are failing to acknowledge something that is the big top secret in this society that no one wants to talk about. Now, what, what age would you, want, would you see starting this curriculum? I, I am looking at pre-K to kindergarten in a child-friendly friendly manner, and it would go by the age groups of how you would discuss it. And I know there would be parents out there that would panic and be like, you know, this isn't my place. There will be other people, you know, that will say this is a parent's position. But a lot of times, most of the time, parents don't discuss this with kids or the parent themselves is the perpetrator. So you can't put yes, it on the parents. 
That, cause, and, and that's an interesting point. And, and, uh, and Jill, I, you know, you and I have talked about this before. With, when you've got the parents, inv- you know, as, as part of the problem or not wanting to believe it, uh, how, how do we, how do you get this kind of a, of, of a law through and to teach this kind of curriculum? Are well, I think within- the majority of the parents are good parents who want their children to be protected and safe. So I think we need to focus on them and understand that they, they're confused. They don't know when to have this conversation or what to say. And so this law benefits them. To the extent that it's being taught in schools and reinforced at home, that's the ideal situation. But certainly the parent who is the perpetrator is not going to be teaching this at home, and that child is the one who needs to hear it the most. So what I like to say is, just as we teach head, shoulders, knees, and toes, as children get older, that conversation needs to go on, and we need to teach children that there are parts of their body Mm -hmm. that are private and are for no one else to touch and see. And it is Mm -hmm. a lesson that can be, you know, child-friendly for the pre-K, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds. And my book is geared towards three- to eight-year-olds, and it makes it very simple, and the very same idea and concept can be taught in school. And it's such a great little, a great book. My body belongs to me. I, it's so readable, and very sweet illustrations. There's nothing, there's nothing that a parent could say. Oh, this is going to scare my child. You know, I, I, and I'm assuming, Erin, too, that you're t- you're talking about this kind of approach. To, to what you're trying to... Uh, oh, de- definitely. A child-friendly approach, not one that's going to scare kids, not one that's going to panic parents. A child-friendly approach where they'll understand it, where it's not something foreign to them, because oftentimes when a kid is abused, they hold on to it. They don't talk about it because they've never been educated on it. Do you know, exactly. I think one of the most important parts of what Erin is talking about, which is also reinforced in the book, has nothing to do with sex or, or anything like that or the body. It has to do with talking to your children about who their safe zones are. So in the yeah. book, there's a line where the child, you know, if you can't tell your parent, you can tell a teacher. But part of the mandate that Erin is talking about is discuss with your child, if you have a problem, you can go to your teacher, you can go to a parent. Mrs. Jones down the street mm-hmm. is someone we trust. We trust identify the safe zones. So whether it's yeah. about experiencing bullying at school, drug problems, whatever it is, they can talk to someone, and that's an important message as well. Now, who's, who's actually writing the this, this suggested curriculum? Jill, are you involved in this with Erin? Well, I have a curriculum that I've worked on myself that, that, you know, to implement in the New York City school system that I've been, um, you know, dealing with. But I, when I found out about Erin and her work, you know, we're standing on the same soapbox. So I immediately mm-hmm. reached out to her because I think it's so important what she's doing. So I'm supportive of everything that she's doing because she's doing it on a much broader level at this point. And there's... And there's- are, are- there's places here in Illinois that do. There's, there's sexual assault agencies that do go into the schools, and they do have a curriculum, but it's not mandated. So only it's only I, reaching a few schools where I want it to reach all of the schools. I got you. I, and and I, I think this is a, this is a, um, a really worthy topic for consideration. Um, so where are you in terms of Illinois? How, how, um, how far along are you and what can we do to help you in Illinois? I've got listeners out there. I know I do. Um, in Illinois, if, if you're from Illinois, I would ask you to reach out to Tim Bivens, and he's the state senator I'm meeting with on Monday. Um, him and I'm meeting with the chief of police, and we're sitting down to discuss this and showing your support. You know, go to his website, type it in, and his website, and email him and let him know that you support this law. I also have a Facebook page called Aaron's Law, and it's a group. And if people can join it, and the more people that we can show that support this idea of protecting kids and getting curriculum, my mission is, once it gets passed in Illinois, to make it a nationwide law. Okay. Can we start in New York next? Jill yeah, and I sure. Will, uh... Sounds great. <laughs> Jill, Jill <laughs> I like I will, that idea. Uh, we'll help you uh, get it into New York next. And, uh, and, and then uh, have, you, have, have either of you thought about what we can do federally? To, to, is this... Is this kind of thing something that can be done federally, or is it only state by state by state? I'm not, I'm not a fan of, of, of big government, but this is one thing I can think of that we could be doing, that government could be doing. I feel if enough people were to reach out to the federal government, we would, we would get a response. I feel it's easier to get a response locally in your state. Mm-hmm. And, and see action happen quicker than by, on a federal level. So what my, my idea is if I can get it passed in Illinois, 
and get, you know, like I said, the media coverage on it, people being aware of it, um, then maybe get the federal government involved. So I'm not going state by state, and we're getting it across all, all states. Because that's, that's, not only is that 52 battles, but it's also 52 different curriculums, <laughs> because you know if each state has... Is, is, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, if each state's going to come up with their own, who knows what the heck is going to be in there. I kind of, that's why I kind of, you know, like the idea of here for once is something where I think that we can, we can uh, go federal on this. But, uh, I, I definitely would like to help you guys, uh, if you're going to do something in, in New York City. Definitely. All right. We're, we're, we'll keep you posted. We're coming. We're coming to a close on the on this segment. So, anything else, uh, Jill or Aaron, that you'd like to mention, real quick? Uh, the book is available, and it, in, in the back there's a suggestion for the storyteller section that really helps parents walk through this subject. And I just know so many parents really appreciate the support and the help. So they should, you know, it's available in bookstores or at mybodybelongstome.com. My butt. Okay. And Aaron, how how can people find you and help you out? Um, like I said, my website, net, and my book, Stolen Innocence and Living for Today, is in Barnes & Noble's borders and can be available um, online. And I would just, you know, I love hearing from people and their support of protecting kids. So um, I hope people will reach out and support me in this mission of getting Aaron's law heard and passed. Okay, amen. I'm, and I'm, and count on me too for support in Crime Prevention 101. We'll, we'll do whatever we can to help. So th- thank you both, Jill and Aaron, you know, for being with me today. I think you've opened a lot of eyes. Thank you. This is Crime Prevention 101, and coming up is one of my favorite parts of the show where I get to talk to one of America's Crime Stoppers group, and we're going to try and help them solve a crime. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your question. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. Hi, this is Susan Bartlestone, host of Crime Prevention 101, and I want to tell you about My Mobile Witness a revolutionary service that transforms your camera phone into a personal safety device. My Mobile Witness believes safety is improved when you remove anonymity from dangerous scenarios. If you're in a stalking situation, for example, if you have an order of protection against someone, or if your profession places you in situations that are potentially dangerous, I want you to check out My Mobile Witness. And you parents of college students, Ask the school to check out the My Mobile Witness University program with custom-tailored options aimed at keeping both students and faculty safe. Every campus could benefit from the My Mobile Witness University service. For more information, go to MyMobileWitness.com. Go behind the scenes of what you see, hear, and read on the news. Learn the ins and outs of public relations on Stars of PR with Cindy R. Every Thursday at 7 a.m. Pacific Time. Cindy Rakowitz is a Clio Award winner and founder of Rock and Roll Public Relations who wants to share her PR experiences and knowledge with you. Learn how to handle a crisis, deal with celebrities, and become a terrific PR executive. Listen to the Stars of PR with Cindy R., Every Thursday at 7 a.m. Pacific Time, here on News Talk Radio, voiceamerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain firing really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. 
You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. This is Susan Bartlestone. I just want to remind you that Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes, so you don't even have to be at your computer to listen. All right, now let's catch a criminal. Today I'll be talking with Crime Prevention Specialist Anita Shell of the Anchorage, Alaska Crime Stoppers. So all my Alaska listeners, I want you to pay close attention. Now, Anita Shell is a Crime Prevention Specialist for the Anchorage Police Department and has more than 21 years' experience in law enforcement, specializing in robbery and shoplifting prevention, security surveys, and personal safety training. For the past 11 years, she has been the law enforcement coordinator for the Anchorage Crime Stoppers program and has been active with Crime Stoppers for almost 20 years. Anita, welcome to Crime Prevention 101. Well, thanks for having me, Susan. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, at the opening of the show, I said that I just have to ask, is it like the movies up there? Do you guys hunt the bad guys on dog sleds or stuff? Or I know that's probably ridiculous, right? That's a little Hollywood. You know, I'm sure that they do that <laughs> up in some of the villages and stuff. But in the big city of Anchorage, we have real police cars, no dog sleds, uh, maybe for the Iditarod. <laughs> but usually the bad guys aren't hanging around the Iditarod, so... <laughs> we'll use whatever means yeah. it necessary it takes to catch these guys. And I, I was even wondering, what do they do when they catch them? Is there like a jail cell sled or something that they pull behind them? The, you know, the, I think somebody the, could make something like that. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen a jail cell a sled, but Why not? Uh, <laughs> somebody Why not? Can figure it out. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit. Talk a little bit about Crime Stoppers in general, and then uh, I want to hear about your particular organization up in Alaska. Well, Crime Stoppers in Anchorage uh, started in 1981, so we've been active for 29 years. And just to give you a little idea about Anchorage, uh, the size of our city is about 270,000 people. So we're not the largest city by far, but uh, we've got a good population here. And since the inception of our Crime Stoppers program, we've made uh, about 1,300 arrests, so that's about 44 a year. And we've cleared over 3,500 cases, which is 120 a year. Um, we pay rewards. Crime Stoppers is an anonymous program where people can call in to a tip line. They are completely anonymous. We don't want their information. We don't want their identity. Um, or I'm sorry, we do want their information. We don't want their identity. Uh, we don't record the line. And what we do is we provide them with a caller number. And it's their responsibility to call back and check to see if their tip resulted in an arrest. And if it did result resulted in arrest, then we pay them a cash reward of up to $1,000. And since we started our Crime Stopper program, we've paid over $276,000 to residents here in Anchorage and across Alaska, really. Fantastic. Yeah, we've, that's also, a, that's... We've, we've seized a lot of property and drugs, too. I don't think, you know, any community is immune to the drug problem, and uh, mm. we have over $22 million in drugs that we've seized since our Crime Stopper program started, and we have also recovered about $2.1 million in property. So our, our program, we feel, is very effective. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, it's true. It's, you, you don't think about it, but sure, drugs... Drugs is everywhere. Drugs right. are everywhere. Absolutely. And what we're looking for is the felon. Uh, you know, we, we, of course, we're, we're concerned with, you know, the small-time user, but we really want to hit that, the root of the problem, um, so the, the bigger dealers. And, and Crime Stoppers only pays out uh, for felony um, tri- type of cases. And so certainly we, we take a lot of drug tips. I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of the tips that we receive are drug-related. Mm. It is a problem. Okay. It's a problem everywhere, but we're sure. we're making an impact uh, not only through Crime Stoppers but through the Anchorage Police Department. And th- in this particular case, Crime Stoppers is part of the police department. That doesn't necessarily have to be correct. No, no, Crime Stoppers is actually not part of the police department. It's an independent charitable organization that has a board of directors who meets monthly to determine the reward amount. Uh, The police department allows myself to be the law enforcement coordinator, 
And so in that capacity, uh, I put the bad guys out in the newspaper, on the Internet, on our website, uh, talk to the press about who we're looking for, uh, forward tips to detectives for follow-up, um, things of that nature. So uh, it's actually oh, okay. kind of separate from the police department, but it certainly is a law enforcement program. Okay, great. Now I want to make that point because I've had a number of Crime Stoppers uh, guests on the show, and you don't need to be a police officer in order to form a Crime Stoppers group Absolutely or anything not. like that. That is correct. Nope, you can form a Crime Stoppers group just for the, the good of the department. You do not have to be a sworn police officer. Fantastic. All right, now does the Anchorage Crime Stoppers have any special programs that you uh, want to mention? Well, we have our uh, website that's up and running. It's AnchorageCrimeStoppers.com, and this is an interactive website where people can log on. They can review some of the unsolved crimes, missing people, wanted suspects, sex offenders, things of that nature, and then they could submit a tip online, and it's completely anonymous. We don't have a way of tracking the IP address from the person who has submitted the tip uh, because, again, our promise, our guarantee to the public is that anonymity will be maintained. And so we go through special procedures to scrub the information so that that IP address is not able to be, you know, tracked to any specific uh, uh, tipster. So that is something that we like to promote. Uh, The website is very effective. They just click uh, if they have a tip to submit, and then they receive a Crime Stopper caller number, and they can check back uh, either online or by calling Crime Stoppers at uh, our area code is 907, and our Crime Stoppers number is 561-STOP, which equates to 561-7867. And so they can check and see if their tip resulted in an arrest, and if it did, then we set up a time Mm. for a payout. Oh, I like that. Very high tech we are here. I like it. Yeah. Um, I think the websites probably are, you know, a lot of kids are really web savvy and they, you know, they may be more likely to go through a website and they certainly have information. So I like that. I like that idea a lot that it's, that it's so out there. And and this is a, AnchorageCrimestoppers.com, correct? That's correct. And what I love about the website is you may have a relative that you knew was wanted in Anchorage, and you can just pop on the web and see what they're wanted for and be able to submit a tip anonymously. And so your relative doesn't have to know that you're the one who dimed them out. You know, they can, mm-hmm. you can submit mm-hmm. that information. And a lot of our tipsters, um, even with the economy as it is, a lot of our tipsters decide not to re- um, get their reward. They put it back to the good of the program, and um, uh, they don't get, you know, pick up any money. They just want to do it to make Anchorage a safer city, and that's fine, too, because uh, uh, we maintain a pool of money um, so that we can pay off tipsters, and if they don't want to claim it, that's fine. We can, it just keep, stays in the pool to pay off other tipsters or, or to keep the program running. You know, and I've heard that from every single Crime Stoppers guest that I've had, People just want to help. They want their communities safer. They want to be part of the solution, and they don't take the money in many cases. And I think that's just so commendable. I I agree. We we lose faith sometimes in humanity, and this is is one thing that, that kind of restores it a little bit for me. Absolutely. Now, Anita, do you have a case in particular that you'd like some information about? And my Alaska listeners, I know we've got you up there. Pay attention to this. Who can, who can we help you with? Well, my personal public enemy, number one, is a person by the name of Ruben Fernandez. Ruben Fernandez was involved in a very public homicide in a parking lot of a Kentucky Fried Chicken store. Uh, this happened in 1995, and we believe he is on the run. He's extraditable uh, from all 50 states. We believe he's on the run either in New York or in the Dominican Republic. So hmm. if folks want to log on to uh, AnchorageCrimeStoppers.com, they can click on wanted suspects and Ruben Fernandez is the very last one on the list as he was the first one entered on our website. So he's been wanted since May 1995 and uh, he's been on the run 15 years like I said but that's not the longest person we've had. Uh, One of my probably the the most outstanding arrest that we've made has been from an individual that was on the run for 21 years. He was actually, oh, no. Yeah, he was arrested in St. Cloud, Minnesota for murdering his wife. He escaped about three years into his jail uh, term, 
and family members hadn't seen him. We have a fugitive task force that's comprised of Anchorage police and uh, Alaska State Troopers and uh, the U.S. Marshals. And that fugitive task force uh, was in contact with his brother, who lived, I believe, in Oregon. And his brother said, well, has my, my, my brother, his name is uh, David Hodel, has been in telephone contact with me, but he won't tell me where he's been, but he did mention he's been hunting and fishing. Well, Alaska is a big place for hunting and fishing, and so we thought, well, maybe hmm. he was here. So this person was put in our daily newspaper, and the first day we got calls. Uh, the phone wouldn't stop ringing. Uh, we got multiple tipsters giving a location on him. One of the best ones was a tipster who worked at a local deli. He said uh, that this person comes in every morning. He has a newspaper with him, and he always orders the same thing. And I looked at the clock and it was about noon and I said, well, is he come in this morning? And she said, nope. And <laughs> I said, well, he must have read the paper already because he's in there. And we apprehended him that night uh, in a kind of homeless makeshift camp outside of our local library and took him into custody after 21 years on the lam. And so that was really Fantastic. outstanding. Yeah. Even Fantastic. Was, I, yeah. I love it. Wanted from a different he, state when we found him. Love it. And he probably thought he was home safe in the, in Alaska, right? Yeah, but you know, people, you cannot, you can run, but you cannot hide in the Great mm-hmm. White North because we do have technology and the capability of doing things that every other police department does have in the in the rest of the United States. So uh, it's not a place for fugitives to run and and be able to hide out from their criminal activities. So that was a real good capture. Fantastic. Well, Anita, thank you so much for being with me today. It's been You're a welcome. pleasure. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure as well. Don't forget to check her out, AnchorageCrimestoppers.com. All right, my darling audience, I'm putting links to all my guests on my Voice America host page and on CrimePrevention101.com, my blog site. So if you want more information and if you've got some tips and you can't find uh, the Anchorage uh, website, you can find it through me. Uh, I want a couple of... uh, Websites I want to give you, um, preventchildabuse.org, if you want some more information about child abuse. There's also CF, C like Charlie, F like Frank, children.org, and they have a committee for children, which is some very good uh, information. APA, Apple, Peter Apple.org, has some really good child sex abuse information there on it. And also N like Nancy, C like Charlie, A online dot org. Also, a uh, lot of child sexual abuse information. Well, that's a wrap for now. But never fear, because you and I will be doing this again, same time, same channel next week when I'll have more stories that demand to be told, more hot crime topics, and of course, lots of tips and resources for you. It'd be a crime not to listen. So stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific at 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guest, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimeprevention101.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.